Hi everyone and welcome to Youth Unite, a series in a, a episodes of uh, Youth Unite and today the topic is emotional intelligence. We are going to do this in two uh, sections, today is a part one which is trying to uh, use EI as a tool for transformative leadership. I am going to begin with a short story and this is a story I heard a while ago from one of my mentors. It's a story of two lawyers in the head. So we have two lawyers. You must have seen two lawyers in the courtroom, if not in reality, at least on the television or on the theater. Two lawyers fighting with each other in the courtroom. Now imagine that these lawyers are in your head. And we have one lawyer called as the yes lawyer and the other lawyer called as the no lawyer. And this is how it normally happens even in a real life scenario, you know, you have one who is the uh, prosecutor, you know, the accused and the accuser, you know, you'll have two opposing parties uh, fighting with each other and the lawyers are trained how to talk for or against uh, their particular client. So now these lawyers are in your head. So imagine, you know, you have one here and one here inside your head, the yes lawyer and the no lawyer. And the question he asks is as follows, who do you think will win? Just like in a normal legal scenario, you have somebody who wins, right? One, one side wins. So if you have a yes lawyer and a no lawyer in your head arguing about something, who normally wins? You know, that's the question that is posed in this particular story. And you have various responses coming in. You know, you have yes wins, no wins, depends on the situation, depends on the topic, depends on what they're arguing about. You know, a lot, lot of responses we keep getting when we do it in live audience. And the real answer to this question is, the lawyer who wins is the one you feed. The one you feed. So I'm going to allow you to rest with this particular thought. So who's the one you're feeding in your head right now? That's the question. And that kind of forms, I would say, the foundation for today in terms of basics of emotional intelligence is it's all in the it's all in the mind and the heart and who is it that you're feeding is the one who will be winning emotional intelligence was made famous in the year 1995 by daniel goleman in the very famous book called emotional intelligence and uh, in this book he he had a series of uh, concepts and theories which became very famous uh, the first uh, being self awareness so I'll just cover a couple of them. Self-awareness led to self-regulation. So self-awareness of all the emotions inside us and that led to a series of exercises, you know, which we can be aware about. And that led to something called as self-regulation. So how can you regulate it? You know, how can you regulate these uh, acts uh, within us? Uh, and you'll see how closely this is linked to heartfulness in, in terms of the practices. So self-awareness led to self-regulation, led to handling relationships and the environment. So how can you use this to regulate and to handle yourself and your various relationships? So that was one of the key uh, concepts propounded in that particular book, which became very famous, translated into hundreds of languages, <laughs> not sure how many. Later, I found a particular website. Uh, and it's a very interesting website. It's called as atlasofemotions.org. Atlas of Emotions, one word, dot org. This is promoted by the Dalai Lama and uh, is just one simple page. It's like a dynamic page in that website. Uh, you will see and you might get confused. There are five emotions which are kind of, you know, it's like a diagramic uh, uh, website. There are five emotions, you know, you have anger, you have fear, you have sad, disgust, etc. You have five emotions. And then you have a moving diagram on top and there are three key columns. The first column is called as trigger. Trigger is, you know, shooting, trigger, okay. The second is called as emotion. And the third is called as reaction, you know, output. So input, what happens, and then the output. It's a very simple formula, uh, but really deeply uh, dived upon in this particular uh, site. 
So you have the trigger and the trigger can be somebody shouting at me. So somebody shouts at me, that's a trigger. Okay, when say, trigger is always external. So somebody is shouting at me and hence the emotion is, let's say I get angry. Okay, so that's the second column. And the reaction is I shout back. So I'm just giving a simple T-E-R, you know, trigger, emotion, uh, and then reaction. But then we dive deeper. So the trigger is not just what the trigger is. So as a person is shouting at me, I am actually a bundle of my memories. So I have a huge list of, you know, 20, 30 years of past memories within me, which could remind me of something when the person shouts at me. You know, so I'm, I'm only carrying some impressions within me as something called as a repository of memories, which is bundled in me. I'm not empty. So when the person shouts, I'm picking up something from this. And I'm also having a current state of mind. I'm probably, you know, uh, lost a job. I have probably you know, lost a relationship. I'm just giving examples, you know. So there's a current state of my environment. Uh, and there's a past, you know, uh, repository with me. And the combination of these two, is like, you know, the ammunition to the trigger. So the trigger actually is helped by the combination of this past and the current state. If both of these are absent, then the trigger might be useless. You know, you, you will really not get disturbed by it. But this creates kind of uh, ammunition, which creates this emotion, which I mentioned as anger, and hence it creates a reaction. So the, now let's understand the second column. So the anger, when it hits you, there's a mental and a physical change that takes place in your being. So that's, you know, understood. Possibly you get, you know, uh, heart starts beating, whatever is the case, you know, that's, uh, and, the, and the mind starts getting racing high, etc. And the reaction, uh, again, here you have few options. You can either react or you can respond. And uh, if you just pause a little bit, it's possible that you can allow the ammunition to fade away. You know, just like in real life, you know, you have a burning fire, and you just allow the fire to kind of fade away, logic prevails, and hence the reaction turns into a response. So you see this whole cycle. Uh, I love this website because it's a very, it's a very simple diagrammatic image uh, which keeps moving when you click buttons, but it gives a complete view of emotional intelligence. Not just that. You change the repository and you change the uh, current state and the emotion starts changing. For example, if possibly I've gone through a fearful episode in my life and a series of fearful you know, sessions within me, and then you shout at me, uh, now I don't get angry. I actually get scared. You know? So you see how the same trigger has caused a different or a different emotion, and hence it will cause a different reaction. And if you, if you kind of see the whole picture around this, we can see how a simple trigger can be uh, annulled just by an awareness. I'm coming back to Daniel Goldman's book on self-awareness. Just by being aware of the situation that I'm in, okay, you know, hold on, okay, I'm going through this particular situation and hence I'm probably getting angry or fearful or sad or disgust. You know, I'm getting this sense of emotion with me. Uh, there's a state of uh, being mindful of what I'm going through that in itself reduces the uh, emotion, reduces the reaction, and turns it into a positive response, you know, that's uh, there around us. So this is a very important, you know, feature which we need to understand in our emotions. I'd like to jump from here uh, into something called as the amygdala hijack, which is, uh, you know, you have the amygdala and the hippocampus right in our, in our uh, brain. And the amygdala is the animalistic reaction, which is the reaction that you see. And the hippocampus is the more responsive reaction, where you think a little logically, you pause, and hence you react in a much more logical manner. So amygdala is where you don't think at all. You know, somebody hits, you hit back, kind of. It's like a mosquito bites, you hit the mosquito. Kind of uh, a quick animal reaction that's there. Uh, hippocampus is where you pause and you kind of understand the situation, the environment, understand where the person is coming from, understand where you're coming from, self-aware, self-regulated, understanding the other person, 
and then you respond in a positive way. But we go a bit further. If you pause even further and you introspect and go deeper in yourself, you can have an intuitive response, which is now you're going into the heart, into the compassion of the heart. And hence, now what you respond, there's a sense of not just calmness, now there's compassion. So you're responding in a very positive manner, in a compassionate manner, and there's a bit of intuition because you're sensing what the other person is going through. You're also sensing what you're going through. You're also sensing what the repercussions could be of whatever actions we plan to do. And hence, there is a very intuitive kind of response. So you move from amygdala to hippocampus to the heart. And uh, that's why it's heartfulness. And hence, you go into the intuitive response in trying to see where we can really gather ourselves and uh, respond in the right manner. The uh, last topic I'd like to take in this particular session is uh, again one of the favorite of, uh, of mine, courtesy Dr. Ichak Adizes, uh, who is also a trainer in our system. So he talks about something called as a mind game, M-I-N-E, mind game. Initially when I heard it, I thought it's you know land mines, you know, mines bursting all around. It's not that, it's mine, you know, what is mine? What is yours? What is mine? And uh, there are three concentric circles uh, he puts around them. Very simple, anybody can understand it, even a small child can understand, which is why I love it. So it's called as a is, want, and the should. So simple, you know, is, want, should. What am I doing? What do I want to be doing? What should I be doing? So where am I right now? Where do I want to be right now? Where should I be right now? So it's a is, want, should. Very powerful. And if you look at it, there are three circles, uh, like a Venn diagram, you know, three circles, and there can be intersections for all the three. So if I'm doing something right now, which I also want to be doing, okay, but I really shouldn't be doing it. Okay, so you're, you're now covering two circles. I am doing it right now. Yes, I'm doing it. I'm probably talking to you. I want to be doing it. That's also correct. But the should factor comes, should I be doing this? Okay, should I be doing this particular action? Uh, and that's where the rules come in. And hence, in such a scenario, you're living in something called as a world of guilt. Okay, or an action of guilt. You're doing something, you want to be doing it. But there's a nagging thought, hey, hold on, I think I'm making a mistake. I shouldn't be doing it. So there's a nagging thought in your mind, which is there. So is and want. Okay, Let's go to want and should. Okay, so I want to be doing it, perfect, I should be doing it, great, but I'm not doing it, okay. So you're living in a world of illusion. Okay. So I want to be in Goa, I should be in Goa, all my friends are there, but I'm not in Goa, I'm somewhere else, okay. So the reality is different. So you're living in a world of illusion, so want and should, taking care, is is not there, so that's illusion. So we covered guilt. We have covered illusion. We come to the third two sets of circles, which is I am doing it, I should be doing it. So now it's perfect, you know, I am doing it, I should be doing it, but I really don't want to be doing it. Okay. So now, you know, you, know, you find this many times in, in, in jobs, you know, a lot of people are, you know, doing something, they should be doing it, but they just feel they don't want to be doing it. Sense of, you know, boredom, sense of frustration. You can sense the emotion as you feel these uh, particular things. So, uh, in fact, if you understand this spectrum and you divide your work into, you know, uh, all your actions, into which bucket do they fall in? Is it is? Is it want? Is it should? Is it a combination of any of them, etc.? And then you come to a central point. I am doing it. I want to be doing it. And I should be doing it. I am doing what I want to be doing, what I should be doing. The central point of all the three circles merging right in the center. And that's the point which is called as the subject matter is the mind game. What I mean. So that's a point where I can say, yeah, this is mine. And there's an example given of a small child. Okay, a small child, uh, some of you must have interacted or may have small children. You give it a ice cream, okay? So the child is having the ice cream. 
So what are you having? Yes, I am having the ice cream. The child says, I am having the ice cream. Do you want to have it? Yes, I want to have it. Should you be having it? Of course, I should be having it. There is no doubt in the mind. So I am doing what I want to be doing, what I should be doing is ingrained in the child's mind. There is no doubt about you know what they are doing. They are exactly doing you know what they want to be doing and as per them, that's the rule, you know, so they should be doing it. So, there's a lot of happiness in that. So, you notice, you know, uh, children will be extremely happy under various circumstances because there is a sense of uh, integration between is, want and should. So, all the actions are very clear, you know, uh, wanting to be doing, should be doing, is, is doing. And it's only in the few occasions where it is, doesn't happen that they start crying. And hence they start doing what they, you know, somebody gives it to them, you know, and, uh, and they go back to happiness. So, the, they are more or less in that central zone where they are doing what they want to be doing, what they should be doing. As we grow older, the circle starts separating away, you know, they start slowly separating. Earlier they are all together, you know, is, one should, there is only one, one way to look at it, you know, three circles in one line. And slowly then the circle starts separating. Now there is something or some desire, some guilt, some frustration you know, starts building in as the circle starts separating. And sometimes they can even totally separate out, which means there is no integration between any of the three circles. And that's when we get into uh, real serious issues of uh, disillusionment, you know, depression, uh, you know, living in... Uh, living in a very, you know, a sad atmosphere when, when everything is quite disparate. You're not able to connect to yourself at all. And what's needed at these uh, points is to slowly bring it back, you know, together and see how you can coalesce these uh, three circles together. So before we leave, there's a small exercise I want you all to do uh, with your friends and colleagues. Uh, choose a close friend who's very close to you. And uh, this exercise is called the art of listening, you know, the way to listen well. And uh, one of the key chapters in emotional intelligence by Daniel Go Goldman is empathy. So this exercise actually is to build in empathy in yourself. And the way you're going to do it as follows. So you're going to just listen to the instructions and later on you're actually going to do it and do send me a note on how you felt it was done. So choose somebody, some partner, could be a friend, could be a brother, sister, anybody. So you're going to sit, you know, with each other, facing each other. So let's say the chair is here, you know, the other person's chair is there. You're going to face each other. And you're going to do a series of listening exercises. You're going to talk about your hobbies. The other person is going to listen. He or she is going to talk about their hobbies. You will listen. You'll talk about your job or education. They will listen. They talk about your job, education. You listen. You talk about your concerns. They listen. They talk about their concerns, you listen. In fact, maybe you can, uh, in case you don't get a person who understands this, you can do it one way where you tell them to talk and you listen. Uh, so the power of listening is where you listen without interruption. You know, you don't interrupt the other person. You listen very deeply, very compassionately. Uh, allow the whole person to talk and uh, focus on the entire being as they talk. Never have any, you know, mobile, you know, many times you see, you know, uh, people saying, huh, yeah, what are you saying? Uh, oh, achha, there was a robbery in your house. Oh, one minute. Huh? So, where did you say the robbery was? Oh, achha, achha, one minute. Huh? Huh, hello, yeah, yeah, yeah. Good okay, fine. Uh, what are you saying about the robbery, etc.? So, this is called as a very distracted kind of listening. So, I want you to, when you do the exercise, focus completely and try to listen. And let me know how you felt. Uh, maybe in the chat or you know how you want to uh, talk to me, you can do it. So with that, uh, let's step into a small round of relaxation followed by meditation. Thank you. Sit comfortably and close your eyes softly and gently. Feel a healing energy move up from the earth into your toes, feet and ankles. Feel your toes relax and your feet relax and allow your ankles to relax.
Now feel this healing energy move up to your knees. As it moves up, it relaxes your calf muscles. Feel this energy remove all the tension from your knees. Now it is moving further up your legs, into your thighs. Feel your thighs relaxing. Now the energy has moved into your hips and waist. Feel them relax. As the energy moves up, your lower back is relaxing. And your stomach. Now the energy has moved into your chest area. Feel it relax. Feel the energy move up your back and into your shoulders. Feel your upper back relax. And feel your shoulders simply melting away. The energy is now moving into your arms. They too are getting relaxed. Feel all the tension from your elbows leaving. And as the energy moves into your forearms, they too are getting relaxed. Remove all the tension from your wrists as the energy moves into your hands and right up to your fingertips. Now move your attention up to your neck. The energy is moving up and relaxing your neck muscles. Now, it is moving into your face, relaxing your jaw and mouth. The energy moves into your nose and eyes, relaxing them. Your cheek muscles are relaxed. Feel your earlobes relax. And now the energy is moving all the way up to the top of your head. Feel it relax. Feel your entire body is relaxed from top to toe. Now move your attention to your heart. Feel that a source of light is already present in your heart and it is attracting you from within. Do not try and see the light, just know that it is there, in your heart. Be open and receptive to a very subtle energy flowing into you.
relax into this feeling. If you find your awareness drifting at any time to other thoughts, don't fight them. Let them be. Gently remind yourself that you are meditating on the light in your heart. Allow yourself to become more and more absorbed within. Remain absorbed until you hear further guidance.
while keeping your eyes closed, gently come out of the state of meditation. Now gently open your eyes. Reflect on what you just experienced. Try and retain this condition as you return to your daily routine.